You're listening to Unlocking Vulnerability, a podcast produced by Helen Pettifer, helping you better understand consumer vulnerability. Hello, I'm Helen Pettifer and welcome to Unlocking Vulnerability. In this episode, I'm delighted to welcome my special guest, Dr. Elizabeth Blakebook. Elizabeth is a Principal Policy Manager at Citizens Advice in the Energy Policy Team. With over 10 years of experience of representation to energy stakeholders and proactively managing the changes resulting from revisions in regulation and legislation. Elizabeth is a subject matter expert on energy vulnerability and draws on her lived experience as a disabled consumer, as well as her research to deliver essential services that are inclusive by design. Leading the Citizens Advice's work monitoring energy supply firms, Elizabeth is a trustee of the Essential Services Access Network, ESAN. Her PhD showed the challenges of integrating people's lived experience into regulatory policy making process. Hello, Elizabeth. That sounds fantastic, all the wonderful things you've done, and it's wonderful to have you as a guest on my podcast. Thank you, Helen. I'm a big fan of the podcast, and it's great to be here today. Wonderful, fantastic. Thank you. So, do you want to just start by giving a brief introduction to yourself? Thank you. So mainly what I wanted to do was to unpack what um, a principal policy manager role um, actually means at Citizens Advice when you're monitoring um, energy suppliers and and looking at energy policy. So what that actually looks like day to day is that my inbox is full of experiences, the lived, live lived experiences of of energy markets on people in their lives. So that might be someone who um, reaches out to their local Citizens Advice because they're really struggling to pay their energy bill. That might be someone who contacts us over the telephone to the consumer service and um, because they've um, had a really worrying letter um, about from their energy supplier or it might be that um, I can use the, the live feed from our website to see what issues are impacting people um, when they're worried about um, what's going on in the energy market and um, so that's when I say that um, I, I work in, in energy and I'm, I'm looking at the, the lived experience I, I really mean that I do get that live feed from those sources. That's brilliant fantastic and it's great to hear directly from the consumer as well, isn't exactly what their challenges are. So I know that your current focus is on innovative uses of data to build rigorous insight into energy market outcomes in the UK, particularly obviously for customers in vulnerable circumstances. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so I think I might be um, stretching the definition of innovation broadly, but certainly very new for energy markets, um, is looking at experiences that go beyond energy. So the way that people interact with their energy um, firm might be set actually in a completely different market. Their expectations might have been developed in interacting with their bank. Their expectation of the way a payment plan is set up might be set by their water company it's actually far far beyond interactions with the energy market or an energy supplier that shape people's expectations and therefore their experiences also something that um, i'm trying to do far more as well as looking beyond energy um, is really to start with the way that people express describe and then and then act on their experiences it's definitely very challenging to move from the the kind of characteristics that you can capture in a tick box and therefore report on whether that's a report that I might want to do at citizens advice or a report that a regulator is demanding from an individual firm but the trouble with focusing on um, a a list of characteristics that a vulnerable customer might self-identify or describe or a firm might want to put someone in, in a particular box really uh, limits the responses and the types of support that people can therefore um, access Um, because it's amazing just how little of life can be captured in one of those tick boxes so in energy we've had this this journey from really six categories categories or characteristics which would would have been captured in the in the early 2000s to do with, with vulnerable customers and um, to an enormous regulatory review and um, that was between 2012-2013 that I mean, the review named a further 28 characteristics or scenarios that firms should incorporate and then went on to say that is not a full list. You must respond to the needs as people are presenting them. So you've got this expectation then that you move far beyond as a firm, you move far beyond the idea of an average customer. Um, And also, I think it, it really challenges the idea that 
vulnerable customers or consumers in vulnerable circumstances, as, as we'd say in energy, that, that they're a minority in any way, because the kind of needs and characteristics that are captured in, the, in that shift to this much broader picture um, include things like suffering from a bereavement or, or um, mental health challenges. And I think the data really clearly shows that those are not minority issues that impact a small group of people. So can we really say that the average customer is invulnerable? I mean, what on earth can you say someone's invulnerable to? And, and certainly not as we sit here in 2020, where so many people have had such a dreadful time in terms of their health, um, even people who have not been directly impacted by falling ill with COVID, the, the challenges of lockdown in terms of mental health, um, and of course the enormous changes in people's financial circumstances. So the idea that as a, an individual firm or as a regulator looking at how a market needs to operate can say, we've got this group over here, we're going to call them vulnerable customers, and then there's everyone else, and that's the average I, I think we can absolutely put that idea to bed in 2020 and um, because we're, we're all vulnerable to changes in circumstances and that leads us to a very different type of thinking about people, their experiences and therefore the needs um, in terms of market regulation and um, also in terms of firms responses. So when I go back to my core role in terms of bringing people's experiences to life and, and using innovative, data innovative to try and express those experiences, that absolutely takes me back to looking far beyond experiences in the energy market singularly. Yeah, fantastic. And I think this year has really highlighted that actually there is no average customer. Everybody is experiencing the, the whole situation with COVID very, very differently. And of course, energy is, is going to be a, a big hot topic moving through winter, isn't it? And sort of getting people to heat their homes and make sure they've, that they're not suffering from fuel poverty. I think that's a very big key topic at the moment, isn't it? Absolutely. So we've been um, very fortunate in energy that we had a very quick turnaround at the beginning of lockdown with um, the, the regulator and government um, working very closely with the citizens' advice to, to set out a set of principles by which um, energy firms must abide. So making sure that people stay on supply um, and those include um, extending um, credit to people who are on prepayment meters and um, so that's why you have to pay for your energy in, in advance of using it um, and that was a particular challenge um, in, in the initial national lockdown where people couldn't access shops or, or had struggles um, in, in getting to the shops to top up their devices and as we go through um, a winter where um, there's um, still um, uh, some challenges in understanding which, which local lockdowns are in operation, what types of journeys might be more or less appropriate. And um, we do see people reaching out more to their energy firms, uh, really quite anxious about not only how they're going to pay their bill financially, um, but how the, the changes in the rules and, and the, the shifting in situation means they'll actually be able to physically access um, their, their being able to top up their device. Um, so it's definitely going to be a really challenging winter um, and what we're asking um, from from energy firms and again I think this will be important for others um, is that the tone of those conversations is very supportive so that people do reach out to, to say what they need in the first place and if, if your main interaction is, is a bill with a red block at the at the top and um, that that means that um, you are likely to put people off from contacting you even if they are actually completely eligible for some support or, or you have a, a particular type of support you can extend and um, you, you need that person to reach out in the first place and the tone of your communications will absolutely set the expectations of that person yes absolutely vital and i think that there are going to be so many customers who are very much on the edge so i think sort of with regards to to their financial situations there were an awful lot of customers who were already struggling to, to make ends meet before the pandemic and then obviously with, with everything that's happened they're, they're really really struggling now so actually just yeah by that that engagement and that tone in, in the communication helps with that and also really important to remember is that many of those individuals will not have had to reach out for that support before so even if they were struggling very close to the edge they may not have been familiar with, for example, how to negotiate a debt repayment plan. They may never have needed to apply for any kind of benefits and, and now need to apply for universal credit. So the, the time 
that those things take might not immediately be apparent to the individual. So they might, for example, contact you to say, well, I'm applying for universal credit, so this is the, the debt repayment plan because they've, they've got some information about how much that is, but they might not be aware of, of quite how long that can take um, and then the impact that that can have beyond um, the, the individual firm that they're, they're negotiating a debt repayment plan with. So really the idea of time for people to come to grips with their new financial situation and then the tone of the interaction from the firm is going to be absolutely vital this winter. Yes, yeah. And I think what we're looking to to avoid across all industries really is actually that that, that consumer, it doesn't come down to them making a choice between actually whether they, they put food on the table or whether they pay their household bills. It, it's giving them the, the ability to avoid that choice. So really, really key. Thank you. I also, I love your mission, which is to transform essential services for everyone through incorporating empathy into regulatory decision-making. I love the word empathy. So what, what does this mean in practice? Well, briefly, in practice, that means putting people's lived experience at the centre of regulatory decision-making. Uh, before talking a bit more about that, though, I'm going to kind of wind back to, to where that mission came from, um, thinking about empathy in, in regulatory decision-making. And it comes from my PhD research which focused on the decision making over 16 years at the energy market regulator often. Um, and I spent um, over five years looking at their decisions um, in their archive. Um, I read 16 years of documents so no one else has to. <laughs> and, and what I did there by, by tracing the decisions, how they were made and the kind of evidence that was brought to bear to make decisions highlighted something um, very important, which was that actual lived experience of people who used energy um, were often secondary or entirely absent when decisions were being made about the design of the energy market. So whereas individual research programs or individual considerations of, of a vulnerability strategy would absolutely engage in a lot of depth in, in people's lived experiences, one of the leading research programs from any regulator started it often but when it actually came to setting the rules that would impact all consumers all the time the focus was on delivering a competitive market that made it easier to switch and the, with the expectation that that would drive firm behavior and the actual behavior of consumers with their willingness to switch but also who would switch was unfortunately absent from a lot of those decisions with instead the idea of a um, highly engaged, information-rich, savvy customer being very central in the minds of, of the people who were actually setting the rules that would then govern the market. And as I read decision after decision after decision that maintained this focus, it seemed to me quite astounding that the evidence in the regulator itself and that the passionate, committed people who had joined the regulator to make a difference for consumers in vulnerable circumstances were just in a completely separate area, having a completely separate debate about protection. Because ultimately, when it came to decision making, the focus was on the idea of this market where people could engage. And to me, that showed an astounding lack of empathy for people's lives and the way that they actually made decisions and the struggles that people face in juggling their finances, in finding the time to engage in a plethora of markets. Um, and then also the, the expectation that um, switching behaviour would somehow constrain firms um, in, in the way that they price which ultimately was challenged um, and we now have a price cap actually in energy um, which I think um, more than anything shows the, the failure really of, of competitive markets to protect consumers um, in energy in, in, that, in the time period that I study. So I, I finished that research and, and kind of move, moved in, into citizens advice and what I come back to again and again is if people who are making those decisions whether it is in government or a regulator whether it's in energy or essential services more broadly if they saw what i see in my inbox 
about the lived experiences of people in, in their real lives rather than some modelled expectation of customers or um, expectations about their future behaviour. I do think that people would make very different decisions, and which is why I spend so much of my time trying to bring those lived experiences to life through the data that I see. That's really powerful, actually. And, and thank you for reading those 16 years of, of, of evidence as well to actually to really sort of actually unlock where it's all come from and actually where, where the gaps and where the failures have been. I mean, and it's so important that businesses and decision makers do have those conversations with the customers that they are wanting to engage with and interact and just sit down with a cup of tea with them and just sort of actually, you know, what's going on in your life? You know, what's impacting you? What's, you know, what are your struggles? What are your challenges? It's so, so important. I mean, I'm definitely in a, in a privileged position there in that I do see the, the, the experiences which are, um, which are captured by, by people who, who work at Citizens Advice. Um, but I would observe that there's also the option um, long term for, for research where for our regulators to commission research that draws out that lived experience and, and we do see that in energy and certainly across the, the board with other regulators also but for firms that your people know they know what your customers are saying they know what they're experiencing they know what their challenges are so even if um, you're, you're coming from a space where you haven't traditionally had um, a, a vulnerability team thinking about vulnerability strategy somewhere, um, you know, at director level, it, just having the conversations with your people to, uh, to draw out um, the experiences of customers can, can be done straight away and you can act very urgently to respond to those, um, those experiences that are reported to your people um, who, who live it all day every day. So you don't always have to listen to me at Citizens Advice, uh, you don't always have to commission big research programs, um, you can talk to your people on the front line, they know. Even frontline staff are energy consumers, mm -hmm. so actually just even talk to your staff about actually their what they're facing with their energy provider mm -hmm. they're facing probably challenges and, and situations you know with regards to vulnerability it, it's not just customers it's actually some some of your staff may be facing vulnerable situations and, and challenges too absolutely so i mean sort of you mentioned about sort of policies and regulatory decision making what is the link between vulnerable consumer policies regulatory decision making and diversity so this takes me back to these ideas which had such power in energy market um, regulation over those, those 16 years that I studied. Um, so I don't know if it's just because it's Halloween week as we're recording this, but uh, I've come to think of them as zombie ideas. You might be familiar with uh, the idea of zombie economics. When I think about zombie ideas, and these are ideas which just will not die. One of them I've already talked about, the, the idea that there's this small minority group somewhere we're going to call them vulnerable customers and if we can just tick enough boxes then we've done we've done what we need to do with this small minority group uh, another is is this this idea that um, competitive markets will naturally drive excellent um, consumer outcomes for everyone now in energy the competition and markets authority um, reported in 2016 that absolutely that had not been the case and what we saw instead was that um, the people who were not getting good outcomes from the market were people with fewer years of education they were much more likely to be over 65 they were more likely um, to be earning less than eighteen thousand pounds a year and they were more likely to be disabled but they also did work and showed that if you had been on the priority service register, which is a, is a, a register in energy um, that captures some of the features I've just talked about in terms of, of vulnerability, you're far less likely to have secured the best deal in the energy market. And to me, that is, was in, and they've got one chart that they put that in. What an absolute failure of a market design that those are the people who are least likely to access the most affordable energy prices. But we still see these zombie ideas being brought to life, that what we need is individual consumers to engage more in the market. And that is going to be what's going to make sure that people have more affordable prices. So that takes me to the thought of, well, how do you get a situation where zombie ideas are challenged, where they're overcome, and we get new solutions to very long-standing challenges about affordable energy? affordable energy services, 
um, and inclusive essential services. There's lots of different ways, but the quickest way is through diversity. You need the people who are making those decisions to come from a diverse range of backgrounds. You need to make sure that the, the um, processes which are being run to bring people together to affect change are with a really diverse um, range of views. And by locking in diversity of both the process and then the decision making, you have far more likelihood of, of overcoming these these zombie ideas, these assumptions, these biases, which have been locked into regulatory decision making for so long. Yeah, fantastic. And I think that is absolutely crucial, isn't it? Do you think then that with everything with, with COVID and everything that's happened this year, that we're going to start to see some, some significant changes? There's certainly a new understanding of the need and the sheer scale of the challenge ahead, I think, is definitely driving a lot more activity. In particular, there's a lot more willingness to reach out beyond individual sectors to respond. Um, so whereas in the past, um, certainly in, in the scope of, of my academic research, um, definitely focus on individual sectors, the firms in those sectors and their responses. Well, that's just simply not able to be done in this scenario where there's so much need crossing so many different sectors. So the willingness, the engagement, the seeking out of ideas has absolutely gone out um, beyond individual sectors and there's far more forums to try and draw people together um, and to collaborate across sectors to look for solutions that make a big difference to people. And I think yeah going across sectors I think is absolutely crucial isn't it and sort of collaboration has been very much a key word this year and and obviously I've put together my vulnerability discussions and it's been great that you've been able to join those so how can organisations, especially those outside of energy, learn from each other and, and better support vulnerable customers? I think it really does go back to starting with the person and to accept that they, their experiences will cross sectors. They will not be defined by your individual interaction as a firm um, and to understand that their needs will incorporate lots of different firms, different sectors, different ways of interacting. And if you can start with that experience as the individual is willing and able to articulate it, that will mean that you can respond to those needs in, in a far more supportive manner. I think it's absolutely crucial, isn't it, that, that we are responding to the needs. I think that's probably the most important fact is that we identify what the needs are and then respond accordingly and appropriately to those needs. So, I mean, it's been, it's been great to have you as my guest. Are there any final thoughts that you'd like to share? Yeah, I mean, just before we kind of go, go into winter 2020, I really want to reiterate this point about tone and time, the tone of communications with your customers and making sure in all journeys that it's a supportive tone um, and then giving people time so much of the response to covid has been around um, extending re, uh, repayment windows or having time where there's a hiatus on debt collection that time is going to be so important to allow people to get to grips with their new financial situation um, before they can engage meaningfully in those important conversations. So I just urge people to be very mindful of their tone and to allow people that time wherever possible. Yeah, fantastic. So important. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And, and thank you so much for being my guest today. It's been wonderful to have you on my podcast and, and for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you. If the conversation in today's episode has raised any questions or has resonated with you, please do get in touch with Elizabeth. Her contact information is in the episode details. Thank you for listening to this episode of Unlocking Vulnerability. Please take care of yourself and stay safe and well. Remember to subscribe to my podcast and leave a review. And you can also follow me on Twitter at hpetfordtrain. And I look forward to you joining me on my next episode.